China is seeking rapidly now to have a first mover advantage. It actually set a goal to establish a cislunar economic zone that favors China by 2050. It's a competition already, and it's just sort of being envisioned, right? And Starship is going to really enable the United States to play in that. Starship is, is it's kind of hard to fathom the scale of it. It is the largest rocket ever built. Its goal is to put roughly 150 tons in orbit every time it launches. For scale, I have a graphic on the right that shows how it compares with some of the other large rockets of history. Obviously, the previous record holder being the Saturn V that got us to the moon in the 60s. It really is very hard to fully grok just how big of a piece of equipment Starship is and how capable it will be. It's also the first fully reusable rocket, so it's designed for both stages to come back to the launch site. Falcon 9 today, SpaceX's kind of workhorse, is first stage is reusable, but the second stage is not. So this is now the first time that there will be a fully reusable capability. And it's really designed for regular airline-like operations. That's at least the stated purpose. It's also designed for in-orbit refueling, and I think we'll talk about that a little bit. And then, you know, just given the size and capability, it really allows us to start thinking in a much bigger way about things beyond low Earth orbit, which is the primary purpose that Starship is created for. We want to think about two primary areas of impact for what Starship will do to the space ecosystem. So one is just, again, in low Earth orbit. It's going to provide the ability to put much more things in orbit than has ever been possible before. So there's clearly going to be impacts from that. Secondly, when you have this ability to put so much mass in orbit and do things like refueling, it really opens the door to doing things beyond LEO. If you look at what it costs to put a kilogram of mass in orbit today with Falcon 9, it's something like $2,000 a kilogram. If you extrapolate to what's theoretically possible with something like a Starship launching very, very, very regularly and sort of economically operating at similar levels to what like airlines operated today, you could imagine at least another order of magnitude uh, reduction in cost of mass to orbit and then ask what does that do in terms of the types of things you could do in space. Once you have this ability to put so much mass in orbit, it really opens the doors to everywhere else in the solar system. And there's a very famous quote that Heinlein is often cited having said that once you're in Earth orbit, you're halfway to anywhere else in the solar system. And that's really a statement of the energetics of space travel. So getting from Earth to low Earth orbit uh, out of the Earth gravity well requires a huge amount of energy. In this slot, you can see it's about 9.3 kilometers per second. But once you're in low Earth orbit, moving to most of the other places in the solar system require less than that. This is a plot of the number of satellites operating in LEO as a function of time going back to kind of the early 2010s, which is sort of the what we consider kind of the new space era. I think the really dramatic thing is that if you look at the slope of this line, this is on a log Y scale, starting in about 2020, we're going to a, a doubling rate of the number of things in orbit about every 18 months. This is a similar scaling trend to Moore's law that happened in semiconductors starting in the 70s. And so we're already in this kind of exponential growth sort of phase of space development. Obviously, now that we think about something like Starship coming online, it could accelerate this even further. The curve is actually faster than an exponential growth rate. If you look at the doubling time over the last, call it eight years, it's about 24 months. But if you look at in the last four years, it's like 18 months. The growth rate is actually now currently faster than Moore's Law, which is interesting. If you think about everything Moore's Law did for electronics, you need to think about the same thing happening in the space industry. You know, some of the lessons of Moore's Law, when you deploy capital, you need to think about returns over two years' time, not 10 years' time, because otherwise you're left in the dust. Just think about how quickly things become obsolete. If anybody here has a cell phone that's eight years old, it's a piece of junk, right? If the Moore's Law is applying in space, then the same thing is going to be true of space hardware. So you need to think on those time scales. Obviously, there's ramifications for just the number of objects in space, so space traffic management, space security. It's a lot more complicated, and it's exponentially more complicated. So again, not linear growth. If you build a system that can handle you know, tracking all the objects in space today, in two years' time, it can only do half of what's there. In four years' time, it's completely obsolete. So you need to design your systems, especially for space traffic management, to be doubling every two years. Otherwise, you don't keep up with the, just the launch rate. What Starship does is rapidly open up an affordable access to what's called cislunar space, which is depicted here, which goes to the moon and the region around the moon. The U.S. is not the only nation that has recognized the potential importance of cislunar space. And actually, China is seeking rapidly now to have a first mover advantage. 
They've actually set a goal to establish a cislunar economic zone that favors China by 2050. It's a competition already, and it's just sort of being envisioned, right? And Starship is going to really enable the United States to play in that, which is pretty important um, because China is already doing things like, we don't know what they did, but they landed on the unlit side of the moon. They have successfully done a what's called a Lagrange point, that L1 there in orbit. So they're moving out and there's resources and they're important potentially economically on the moon and on the asteroids in the cislunar region. I think a little bit more of the dark side, which is sort of the national security perspective, sorry folks, but you could militarize this region. It's very easy to hide in cislunar space. It's big. I mean, we just talked about the challenges of doing space situational awareness in low Earth orbit. There's a lot of stuff to track. But think about trying to track things in that entire volume that's shown on this picture. If you hide in these particularly attractive regions that don't require a lot of delta V, a lot of gas, you can stay there a long time. And then you can appear and easily come down and enter one of the Earth orbits for various reasons that one can imagine that are kind of scary. So a challenge for the future and an opportunity for the United States is to think about how we're going to operate in this area. And that is just beginning to be thought of. Infrastructure is really critical. And again, I think Starship, with its great capacity to carry large quantities of things into this region, is going to be really important. And so if we're going to actually be playing in an economic zone in this region, we're going to have moon bases, right? We're going to have to have infrastructure on the moon. China's next planned mission to the moon is at one of the poles because that's where they think the water is, right? So water is a resource you're going to have to have access to. One of the big economic attractions of the moon is mining. There's normal elements there that will be, have some value, but there's also the potential for rare earth elements. And so you're going to have to have an infrastructure to support mining operations. In the short term, I think the space traffic management and the space situation awareness is probably the first sort of blocking thing that we're going to run into in the very short term. And that's just because of the traffic jam that's happening in low earth orbit. And that's where the regulations and policy are going to play a role here sooner than people think, but also the technology, because from a security standpoint, you can't think about, oh, an adversaries, I'm going to monitor all their satellites all the time. I put an analyst on each one. It doesn't work when they have 10,000 spacecraft and they're all doing a maneuver every single day or multiple times a day. Collisions in space, just the debris problem and management of constellations. So I think the issue of scaling of situational awareness is critical infrastructure, I would put it that way. And it's sooner than people think. Again, even when we started Leo Labs, there were 800 active satellites. 10x since we started this company. In two years, it's going to double again. In two years, it's going to double again. Okay, well, 400% in the next four years. All right, you've got to grow exponentially at a faster rate than that. And I think tracking and situational awareness, you need to think of that as critical infrastructure also. I know that all three of us in various forms are very interested in science as well and like what we can learn about our world and the universe. And so I think the other thing that I'm personally very interested in, I expect you all are, is this capability to launch the mass at the cadence and everything else into space that Starship represents will mean for how we think about science in space. I think it's incredibly exciting what we can learn from, from what Starship can enable. You can now launch large sort of scientific labs and keep them in orbit pretty far out, maybe keep them in orbit, you know, around the moon or on the moon. You can look at how much we've just learned from James Webb. It's kind of unbelievable. And so I think that if we could launch uh, telescopes like that and, and put them out there, then yes, absolutely, we can learn a lot more about that. I think the other thing that's really interesting is we can learn more about the origins of the Earth and the path that it, it might be on, where we may or may not want to learn, but we should learn, but also kind of what that might mean for other bodies in the solar system and beyond. <coughs> and so I think the scientific opportunities that it, it opens up are, are huge. And frankly, in the past, it's also been a place where countries can come together and work together in a peaceful way. Yeah, with as much as James Webb has shown us, what if we were launching a James Webb oh. once a year, um, oh or you're the successor to James Webb once mm -hmm. a year, ideally not built on a 30-year time scale for $10 billion, but you know, have, leveraging some of these unit economic changes to do things a little bit differently. Oh, I have my wish list of things I want to see happen. I'd love to see imaging of an extraterrestrial planet. You need very large optics, very large light gathering ability, and some very good coronagraphs to do that. But with active coronagraphs, that might be possible. It's all about cost. We can do these things. 
cost and time. You need to make these things doable on a graduate student's career. Like, if a project takes 30 years, then the graduate students do not work on it because you'll never get your PhD doing this unless you're building one little widget. <laughs> Four-year time scales, that's what we need. I want to see that. I would love to see a wide field survey telescope, the equivalent of the Vera Rubin Observatory, which is coming online, the world's largest ground-based observatory for surveying the sky. First light later this year for finding and tracking asteroids. Asteroids are super critical because they are where the resources are. They tell us about the formation and evolution of the Earth but most of these were part of a failed planet. Their distribution of their orbits tells us how the solar system evolved. And finally, they hit the Earth. And so knowing the locations of all these asteroids is essentially mapping the solar system. You know, why did Italy and Portugal and Spain and England spend all their treasure mapping the Earth? Because they knew there was security, there was science, there was trade. And for the same reasons, I think we need to map the solar system. And I think the key to that is a very wide field of view, astronomical imager in space, that's possible now. I, you know, five years ago I would have said, you know, Vera Rubin is the way to go. Best you're going to do right now, but um, I think that equation has changed. Yeah, and there's even some proposals now for the next great telescope to be built in craters on the moon. Again, mm -hmm. to build a giant telescope in a crater on the moon, you would need this capability. You'd yeah. be able to launch huge amounts of mass and have the infrastructure. When you do don't it. have to do it like the ISS, piece by piece by piece over 20 years, mm -hmm. then you can build and test fly, iterate, and it just changes the way you develop projects like this. And I think you can, we can bring the time scales in by a factor of 10.